had some 3D stuff in it, but like, I, I think we're, okay. I think we're at the Real point talk. where we need to admit that this was never really a great franchise. Nope. And that we, they, we keep trying and trying and trying to find this thing that was never really actually no, there. Sonic was never good. This is IGN. If you have ever been in any kind of video game space on the internet, you have inevitably heard of them. It is one of the biggest video game outlets. It has been operating since the 90s and has a fair share of popular podcasts under its banner. They also host reviews, previews and news coverage on the topic of gaming. Basically everything you could come to expect from a video game enthusiast website. It is pretty ordinary to be completely honest with you. With that said, however, you might know IGN better as the most unethical, biased and comprehensively terrible excuse for video game journalism out there. At least if you listen to a certain subset of gamers, that is. According to some, IGN as an entity is simultaneously biased against Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft and fighting games that aren't from Capcom. They take bribes from publishers and they lie about games for their own personal gains. And most of all, they are stupid poo-poo heads for giving the wrong scores to the games you care about. Fuck you, IGN. Fuck you. 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 You wanna know why I'm fucking IGN? Because of this. You have probably already heard it a thousand times by now. A new release gets what is perceived to be a too high or too low review score. Someone utters an opinion about a video game that doesn't fall in line with what another group believes, and suddenly, all hell breaks loose. It is essentially a regrettable part of gaming culture and identity at this point to fight over completely arbitrary numbers and even the most lukewarm opinions. When an IGN podcast co-host said that Sonic was never good, a lot of people took it as confirmation of the unfair hatred they knew had always existed there from the very beginning. The backlash was swift as the words stirred ire of fans who could finally point to concrete evidence that IGN hates Sonic the Hedgehog and that they have an evil agenda against the series. Which explains all the bad reviews they have given to Sonic over the years. We finally have it. The undeniable proof that IGN and other gaming critics have a hateful agenda against the Sonic the Hedgehog series. I suspected it for years, as in their reviews they could never review a Sonic game fairly, you know, treat it the same way that they would with other series. Indeed, IGN writers have given some fairly low scores to Sonic games in the recent past, such as the scathing 4.5 review of Sonic Unleashed back in 2008. It's not really the best written review IGN has ever published, if you ask us, but part of a hateful agenda against Sonic the Hedgehog? Hardly. The truth of IGN's collective stance on Sonic seems to be a bit more balanced, evidenced by their rather glowing scores for Sonic Colors, Generations and more recently, Sonic Mania. Even Sonic Forces, which according to some fans, is hyperbolically the worst Sonic game ever made, got a fairly decent score, all things considered. In a similar fashion, more recently fans got very upset when IGN writer Jonathan Dornbush reviewed Spongebob Squarepants' Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated and gave the remake a mediocre 5 out of 10. And it might be hard to believe that a kids-friendly platforming game about a yellow sponge could cause any form of outrage. But here we are. Maybe most outrageously, there were even several people comparing it to IGN's The Last of Us 2 review that had recently been published. I bet it's more fun than The Last of Us Part 2. This review comes from the guy who reviewed The Last of Us 2 and called it a masterpiece. Still better than The Last of Us 2. I guess if it's not LGBTQ2, it's not a 10. Don't give up your day job because your reviews are crap. This gets a 5. Well, The Last of Us 2 gets a 10. We've lost touch with reality. IGN. Still better than The Last of Us Part 2. Imagine giving The Last of Us Part 2 a 10 out of 10. In this game, a 5 out of 10. 
How the hell are you gonna give TLOU2 a 10 out of 10, but SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated a 5 out of 10? Bad review. And here we thought IGN were supposed to be the unfair and dishonest ones. Comparing scores of completely different games in this manner is not entirely uncommon though. Most notably, Imagine Party Babies, a realistic gamer simulator for Nintendo Wii, got a score of 7.5 from IGN way back when, and has since then been used to mock the outlet for games they scored lower, like Luigi's Mansion, Death Stranding, Earthbound Beginnings, and so on. Some might say that it is ridiculous to compare review scores like this, and they would be absolutely right. It is of course partly a joke, but just like the too much water meme, the mocking nature of these ideas holds some truthful opinions to them. Now to be perfectly clear, we are not here to play the IGN defense squad or anything, it is simply the most prominent example out there. However, they are far from alone of course. Other examples include Jim Sterling's 7 out of 10 review of Breath of the Wild that brought militant fans to a feverish frenzy. The Last of Us 2's outstanding critical reception was attacked across the board, and the absolute disbelief in Mass Effect Andromeda possibly being bad are just a few that come to mind. With these brief examples as a base, we would like to loosely come up with free thoughts about what defines this particular group of gamers. Let's call them the passionate gamers. 1. Based on how individual statements are often being attributed to IGN as a whole, the passionate gamer seems to be casually viewing review outlets as monoliths, groups of complete uniformity. It is a sort of us against them mentality, where they separate themselves by perceived differences. IGN are biased liars, while we are not. 2. A lot of the passionate gamers have trouble accepting other people's opinions. In fact, most of the more vehement disagreements over review scores seem to be based on a subconscious idea of my opinion is right and yours is not. The need to be right is a rather normal behavior for us as humans to engage with. After all, if you are not right, then you are quite frankly wrong. And in that sense, I need to be right. And if you do not agree with me, then that obviously has to make you wrong. And free. It seems the passionate gamer is so heavily invested in certain video games that it has become tied to their identities and self-esteem. Which could partly explain why they are so defensive about review scores, to the point where they see insignificant opposing opinions as almost equivalent to direct personal attacks. And it does make sense, as our opinions are a big part of our identities, and often get entangled with what we deem to be moral. We would like to think that these three points in turn at least partly explain why the passionate gamer has trouble reading, understanding, and accepting reviews for what they are. Opinion. On July 10th, 2018, Game Revolution published a review of Sonic Mania Plus, an updated version of the original Sonic Mania that had been released a year prior. Writer Michael Leary gave the game a solid 3.5 out of 5, saying that it might be what Sonic fans want, but that the old school game design holds it back in the contemporary market. While not the most glowing review, it can certainly be considered a good score, and coming from a fairly unknown outlet, one could assume it would slip by unnoticed. Trouble was, however, that Game Revolution's previous review of the standard package Sonic Mania by Matthew Utley had gotten the higher score of 4 out of 5 which logically couldn't make sense considering Sonic Mania Plus was the same game, you know, just 
pluser. More content means a better score, right? It is simple math, really. A few days later, on July 15th, YouTuber GamerGuide7Aces uploaded the video The Hypocrisy of Game Revolution Sonic Mania Plus Reviews, which we found to be a fairly good case study of this entire subject. It proclaims games media as hypocritical, untrustworthy, unprofessional, and frankly, incompetent because of how they approach reviews. As an example, the discrepancy between IGN's previews and review of Sonic Lost World is used, while the fact that they were written by different people is dismissed with the words. I'm like, that's no excuse. You're a professional company. You gotta represent, you gotta show consistency. You can't have two people giving different reviews on something, right? To us, this comes off as a rather strange thing to say about reviews and previews, considering their nature as opinion pieces. GamerGuide himself even seems to unconsciously agree with us, as he contradicts the entire point later in the video anyway, when he clearly states that But playing a game, you're experiencing it yourself, so everyone's going to have a different experience. We would like to acknowledge that this was obviously made in an unscripted environment, and as such, blunders are to be expected. This one is just a bit poetic in a sense. What we did find most fascinating about this video, however, was one particular statement that we think reveals a bit more of this narrative surrounding video game reviews and will be the bridge for us to reach the next part of this video. Building on the first statement about consistency between reviewers writing for the same outlet, GamerGuide has this to say. What's the point of reviewing the same game if you're going to have different people giving it different reviews? Then which one is the most legit one? Which one is fake? You know what I'm saying? Which one is the legit one? And which one is the fake? You might assume this is just another blunder, but without describing too much intent to these words, we believe they do reflect some underlying beliefs that have been cropping up in the discourse for quite some time now. This black and white idea of reviews either being real or fake, true for deceit, or perhaps more succinctly, objective or subjective. This conflict seems to have created a desire in some people for a so-called objective review, which most of you watching will probably take in disbelief, maybe even as comical and absurd. It's a logical short circuit, a lingual paradox, that a review, a subjective account, could in any way be presented as objective. But it seems for a substantial part of the gamer demographic, it somehow still has some rationale to it. The concept of the so-called objective review is in an absurd sense a logical next step if you believe games journalists are too biased, unprofessional, hypocritical and generally give the wrong review scores. However, when we say that it has some rationale to it and that it is a logical next step, that of course doesn't mean that it is inherently valid, because we would say that it quite clearly isn't. It comes from a faulty framework to begin with. It doesn't truly take into account what an objective review would even be. In fact, we don't even think it is controversial at this point to say that there can't be such a thing as an objective review of a piece of media. Now, some of you might not actually agree with us on this, or these statements might not be as self-evident as we'd like them to be. So. Let's break it all down just to make sure we're all on the same page here. Let's get to the bottom with why chasing the idea of the objective review simply is a futile and counterproductive effort. So, what even is a video game review? Well, to put it bluntly and really dryly, a video game review is a collection of objective and subjective statements. In practice, this means that we can look at things that are objectively true in a game, and in turn, objectively state so. Mario can jump, Fallout 76 has bugs, Y2K has a male protagonist called Alex, and so on. 
all of these things are factually true about each respective game, but as soon as we try to evaluate these aspects further, we are inevitably entering the realm of subjectivity. To assess whether these things are indeed good or bad is of course expressing an opinion about them, which means you can't objectively say something to be good or bad, as they are inherently value judgments based on subjective experiences. Let's make another statement as an example. Sonic the Hedgehog is fast. If we agree this to be objectively true about Sonic the Hedgehog 2, we may still ask ourselves the question if this has a negative or positive impact on the game, and come to wildly different conclusions. The speed of Sonic is actually a pretty clear-cut example to use, considering how fairly contentious it is among people if it is a good or bad thing. And then we could even argue that it is up for interpretation if Sonic is truly fast or not, depending on what we compare him to. Speak for yourself, motherfucker! <laughs> the, the point anyway is that there is no objective truth to the answers of such questions, because said answers are everything but neutral. You may even say that they are directly antithetical to what being objective even means. It should not have to be stated, but there obviously are no objective opinions, as opinions by their nature are the results of your beliefs, feelings, perspective, and so on. They are inherently subjective. And in that sense, the difference between fact and opinion is quite clearly defined. It is the difference between saying Sonic is a blue character that is able to run, which is a fact, and Sonic is a good character because he is blue and able to run, which is an opinion. We have seen some claim that there are ways of saying a piece of media is objectively good or bad, because there are standards that can be used to make and in turn analyze said media. A movie might, for example, follow the so-called rules of filmmaking, and a script could pertain to what is commonly accepted to be best practice. But is that truly objective? Sure, you can probably objectively say what kind of standards a movie is adhering to, but they are just that. Standards. They have been collectively accepted as the way of doing things. But that does not mean that a film not following these rules is objectively bad, and vice versa. Movies are of course not alone in this, there are standards for most practices. Even video games. But when it comes to games, it becomes a bit more complicated because they are, as you know, INTERACTIVE ENTERTAINMENT which brings with them a lot more ways of experiencing basically the same thing. Unlike films, video games are controlled in a lot of different ways, and while there are standards to how you generally control most games, defining a true right or wrong is basically impossible. Heavily through their tactile nature, the quality of game controls are almost always judged by personal taste, previous experience, skill level, perhaps even cultural background. And with all that in mind, we have to ask ourselves, what are bad controls? And is such a question even adequate when examining how we perceive controls? In 2004, the modern classic Katamari Damacy was released in Japan. The game centers around a small character rolling up everyday objects into an exponentially growing ball within a 3D environment. Since Super Mario 64, most games set in this kind of space use the left control stick to move the character freely in a way that has become so common and obvious that it's now second nature for most players. In Katamari Damacy, however, your navigation through the virtual space is contextualized by the pull and force of pushing a real-life giant ball around. As such, both control sticks work in tandem to control the in-game action, something wholly unique to this series. 
It's not unbelievable that most new players will find the control scheme odd and jarring, perhaps even wishing they could move around more freely, like in other games. But it seems this peculiar approach quickly grows on players, as it furthers the chaotic nature of the game, while also effectively conveying the weight of the ball in a surprisingly natural way. This control scheme is admittedly very unconventional, to the point where it doesn't follow any standards at all. One might even say that it completely disregards them. But is it bad? Or just really different? It can perhaps show us how fleeting such standards are, and that conforming to them doesn't necessarily make a game good. Not to mention how standards have changed with time, especially in a rapidly evolving medium such as video games. An almost comically perfect example of this is Stephen Garrett's early 2000s review of the PlayStation game Alien Resurrection, where he stated that The game's control setup is its most terrifying element. The left analog stick moves you forward, back, and strafes right and left, while the right analog stick turns you and can be used to look up and down. It might sound funny to us today that Steven essentially complained about the idea of moving the camera with the right analog stick, something that would later become the gold standard in most FPS games going forward. But this control scheme was in hindsight kind of groundbreaking, and with that in mind it is not unreasonable why someone would have been turned off by such a leap forward. In the video Tank Controls and What Bad Controls Really Mean, Pim is Online likewise brings up this review and makes the excellent point that what we perceive to be bad controls could be ones that we are not entirely familiar with, or those that fall outside of what at the time is seen as the norm. The point of all of this is that quality isn't always so clear cut, and our understanding of what constitutes as good and bad could be informed by our previous experiences just as much as anything else. As such, trying to even approach some universal set of quality values, even if it is just attempts to stay inside the frame of inoffensive and agreeable areas, is ultimately futile and it might even hurt our understanding of video games. Are games with unusual control schemes bad at being games, or just bad at following the norm? Is a technically inferior NES game de facto uglier than whatever is out on PS5 today? Between Kirby and Dark Souls, can we find the objective sweet spot for what the true correct difficulty level is? Or are we to assume the hardcore gamers claim that more hard is always the gooder? What is the ultimate quality aspect of Sonic Speed? Do you see what we're saying here? How could you possibly evaluate a video game on a slider from 1 to 10 without doing so through your own interpretation and assessment of what you just played? There are no mathematical formulas to determine that Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg is absolute horse shit. There is no horse shit Fibonacci sequence. There's just Billy Hatcher and his giant fucking egg. So you might look at this and think that, well, of course everything is in flux in the minute details, but surely, on a grander scale, there simply must be things that are so obviously good and obviously bad that anyone could agree on a quality judgement about them. No. You know what? I once had a friend whose favourite game was Sonic 06. He loved that shit. And he talked so passionately about it, with no irony in his voice. And you know what? That's fine. Great even. At this point, there are plenty of people who like Sonic 06. And they perfectly prove the point that quality is highly subjective. To be quite frank with you, the gamers complaining about review scores and demanding objective unbiased reviews don't even have an objective idea of what the objective review is. Basically, there doesn't seem to be any unified understanding of what it truly means, and at some point, the words doesn't even appear to apply at all. You could say that the concept of the objective unbiased review is paradoxically very subjective. 
Let us look at three more examples that we found quite compelling. Try to work out what is truly being said and then take it from there. In the video My Brutally Honest Shenmue 3 Review, YouTuber Dreamcast Guy tackles the latest and highly anticipated game in the Shenmue franchise. He had been waiting 18 years to play this monumental title. He loves the franchise and has beaten the other games several times before. He also backed the Kickstarter and spent hundreds of dollars on the collector's edition. With that in mind, it might seem peculiar when he claims that this will be a completely unbiased and objective review. Now I just want to say right up front, this video is going to be completely unbiased. While I am somebody who very much loves this franchise and have beaten the first games again and again, for Shinmo 3, I want to take a look at it objectively, seeing what makes it good and really kind of honestly talking about the holes that kind of drag it down. Judging by the content that follows in the video, there does not really seem to be any substantial difference between a regular old subjective review and this supposedly objective one. In fact, the way these purportedly unopinionated ideas clash with where they come from becomes straight up surreal. Using these words to describe this otherwise rather typical review might even be to its detriment as they ring a bit hollow during the video's 15 minute running time. While digging around for other examples of unbiased objective reviewers, we found a thread from 2016 on the GameFAQ forums, started by The Pouncerer, where he asked for the most objective reviews out there. Well, of course mentioning how bad IGN are too, can't forget about that one. There were of course a lot of great replies in this thread, like this one insightful gem posted by the user Watchdogs. I would only trust reviews by people who have proven themselves in the real world, like Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, while well, we found that to be very interesting, we found that the very first reply of the Fred from Yeagood259 Oz was the most helpful here. He very matter-of-factly stated who he believed would fit the bill. The YouTuber, Angry Joe. Wow! Wow! Great mission design, Bioware! I didn't like it when Destiny had this form their main mission structure, and I like it even less when Bioware does it. Without disparaging Angry Joe or anyone who enjoys his content, we do find it peculiar to even suggest that he would be anything but subjective in his reviews. From the fact that his entire persona is derived from the old school angry reviewer mold, to the way he actually presents his criticism, we don't really see how he in any way strives away from the subjective nature of reviews. In the end, he presents his personal opinions based on what he has experienced, like everyone else does. Also mentioned in this GameFAQ thread, as well as several other places, is the more traditional Easy Allies, an independent video game website created by former game trailer staff. While they do gain a lot of points for it being supported by the viewers, rather than having to rely on advertisements, and how they are very transparent about review copies received, we don't think it makes sense to call their reviews any more objective than anyone else's. In fact, we highly doubt even they would claim such a thing. Demon Souls on the PS5 is one of the finest examples of a remake out there, thanks to its stunning visuals, great music, and numerous quality of life improvements. As you might have gathered from these examples of so-called objective reviews, they do have something quite striking in common. We do not think that they can actually be considered anything other than subjective. They all, first and foremost, clearly deal with opinion, value judgments and evaluation of personal experiences. And in that sense, they are not even any different from the reviews published on IGN. And with all that in mind, we might have to ask another question, with a very straightforward answer. Do the gamers asking for it even actually want objective unbiased reviews? And the answer is no. 
it should not be too hard to see why no one truthfully would want the dystopian version of game coverage that Jim Sterling made fun of all the way back in 2010 in their 100% objective review of Final Fantasy XIII. Because the concept itself doesn't make any sense. The idea is fundamentally and diametrically opposed to what a review of media entertainment and art even is. In reality, all the objective unbiased review can truly be called is a misnomer, and the words simply do not match up with what is really being asked for. What that is, though, may vary wildly from person to person. But for this essay, we would like to focus specifically on two different scenarios of what is truly being said. In the worst case scenario, the person saying that they want objective unbiased reviews, subconsciously or not, really want the very opposite. That is to say, that in truth, they want reviews to be skewed towards their own personal opinions, even if it is about things that they have not even experienced themselves yet. Referring back to the defining traits of the passionate gamer that we came up with in the beginning of the video, this is most likely because of how heavily invested they have become with certain video games. They spend time, energy, and money on these games, to the point where said games get tied up with their very identities as gamers. And a review at that point is only there to validate what they already believe and make those resources spent feel justified. It is a way to make sure that their confirmation bias is always satisfied in the end. In the best case scenario, the person saying that they want objective unbiased reviews simply mean that they want honest reviews, which in and of itself is a pretty vague term. There are probably very few professional reviews out there that are not the writer's honest opinions. But from what we have gathered, it is mostly about honesty in the sense of not having been bought off by shitty corporations to say nice things. Despite this being the exception rather than the rule, there is still a notion that mainstream outlets like IGN frequently engage in this kind of behavior. It could also have to do with a perceived lack of knowledge, but mostly skill, when it comes to particular video games that make these reviewers deemed unfit to do their job. Mind you, both scenarios can, and probably do quite often, intersect with each other. In either case, the word objective is used more or less because it sounds really good on the surface. It brings associations of truth, facts, logic, and rationality, unlike subjectivity, that is a bit more flimsy. It deals with feelings, abstraction, and can't really be quantified. Really, it is a simple question of being right or wrong, and nobody wants to be wrong, right? It doesn't even have to be true, because it could just be a form of virtue signaling where you ensure the audience that you are in fact not IGN. So of course it's appealing at first glance to throw it around willy-nilly, even if it's not truly what you mean. And yeah, you could obviously talk about integrity and issues within the mainstream game press, as there are interesting things to talk about there. We do, however, genuinely believe that this mindset is absolute poison to that sort of discussion. Complaining about reviewers' opinions and what scores are given to the latest games, while claiming writers to be bought liars time and time again, does not make a case for your objective reality, because you can't even abide to its rules yourself. Intentional or not, it holds video game criticism and analysis back and is a real detriment to anyone who wants to express themselves in this space. It is this mentality that made someone like Dreamcast Guy feel the need to say that his Shenmue 3 review was unbiased and objective, even though it clearly was not. And you know what? That is just a real shame. In a world not restricted by these ideas of reviews as anything other than subjective, Dreamcast Guy would be free to express himself without metaphorical shackles keeping him down. 
His opinion as a superfan would be just as valid as anyone else's, and it would even be seen as valuable in its own right. Because truth be told, it is. We should not be afraid to embrace subjectivity, as different opinions, readings and ideas are the lifeblood of healthy discussion about entertainment media and art. The value of different viewpoints is that we can get a richer palette of opinions to compare and learn from. Anything prohibiting that is us dooming ourselves to endless stagnation. But we will leave you with one objective truth though. All reviews are inherently subjective. Thank you for watching this all the way to the end. We actually spend all night trying to finish this thing. Uh, so I hope you appreciate it. And if you do, you can support us on Patreon like these lovely people did. Andrew Jones, Anonymous, Afayette, Ben Clark, Bibi the Bitch, Cult of the Hyena, Ember, I'm a Dumb Baby, Joel Nilsson, Luke, Matthias Graman, Meow Mix 64, Nate Kiernan, Nishtsvet, Sweet Pink, Tommy Håkansson, Saifi, Abigail Nail, Andreas, Aaron Rain, Basklin, Billy Moran, Botch Frivari, Charles Goldhaber, Chloe, Eli Berg Maas, Emrasa, Fluffkist, Gage McCulgan, Jari Olsson, Mar B, Mikkel Ottens, Tobias Matson, Dat Jess, Vexelbun, Whiskey Dono, Andreas Argulander, A Wingless Monkey, Bald Space Marine 33, Ben personally approves this message, by a Panda, Baba Kenzie, Case Explosion, David J. Bradley, Emil Olin, Flynn Flamberge, Florian David, Frankie Teardrop, Goblin, Gothic Garfield, Isaac Abramson, Karen Schulz, Magnus, Melang Rubin, Miko, Morgan, Oscar Funes Galindo, Riley Rose, Roe, Silly Rookie, Starfighter, TB Skyen, Tegan Bread, Trash Baby, Tough Emily, and Salty Boy. If you too want to support us on Patreon, you can do so on patreon.com slash transparence. That's what pays the bills and makes us able to do more stuff in the future. So please consider it. Until next time, have a good one. <laughs>